Hey, everybody. Uh, I meant to get this. There's the music. Ha. The, it, um, all right, everybody. Sorry. We're still getting used to this new format. Um, something didn't happen that I wanted to happen and got me a little confluffle there. All right, everybody. It's time once again for the Mythwits, the show dedicated to all things geek pop culture, drenched in absurdity, and coated with sarcasm. Every week, we bring on an industry guest and uh, do our best to be funny, but there are no guarantees. Um, uh, bu- 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 sorry, I fell off my thing here. I'm your host, Peter Bryant, and joining me on this episode is my co-host, Mike Kafis. Hello. Yeah, sorry, that thing threw me totally off. Um, uh, and on this episode, we are talking with Matt Brady. That's me. Hey, Matt. Uh, Matt is a high school science teacher and co-founder, executive producer of thescienceof.org. Since he started teaching over 10 years ago, he's used pop culture to get his students engaged with science. Hey, we do that, Mike. And his (laughs) new book, The Science of Rick and Morty, is an example of how he gets students and others interested in science after hooking them up with pop culture, which is great. I mean, that's that's what we try to do, Matt, on this show. Uh, We we don't just do science, but science is one of the things we love to do. Cool. Uh, And we approach it with uh, wit and sarcasm and goofiness and and, uh, as much pop culture and stuff as we can because science... We want to make science fun because it is. It, yeah. it really is. Yeah. So um, so you, you wrote a book, The Science of Rick and Morty. And I was telling, I was telling Matt at the, uh, at the, in the pre-show, and, to, and Mike knows this, uh, I didn't get into more, Rick and Morty until just recently. Uh, Mike was trying to turn me on to it, right, Mike? For what? How uh, many two years? Was it two years? Yeah. Yes. I was like, dude, you've got to watch this show. It's, just, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Right, and I, and I wasn't against it. It's just, you know, I only have so much time oh, for, for, for shows and stuff. So then uh, Steve, so Steve Wallet was the original one who was c- contacted. He said, hey, you want to interview this guy, uh, Matt, for uh, the book um, Science of Rick and Morty? I was like, hell yeah, let's do that. So then I was like, oh, that's it. Got to watch it now. And I freebased the whole thing over a weekend. So <laughs> <laughs> I think there are like warning labels about that. That's, yeah, I know, that's right? great. <laughs> And, and I would like to say I actually was able to get an advanced copy from a friend of ours who your publisher was uh, publicist was uh, talking to, and, and he kind of uh, referred you to us as well, which we were happy about. Cool. Uh, and Great. I I was not able to read the whole thing, but I'm still hooked on reading it. So I'm I'm like I'm I will be reading it after as I go to bed <laughs> tonight. Um, and I definitely want to touch on a couple of chapters, and I have a couple of things that I haven't gotten to in the book that I still have in our notes that I would definitely want to get. Cool. To. But before we get started, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Uh, we know you're a teacher. Where do you teach? I am in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, which is about an hour or so north of Charlotte, North Carolina. Winston-Salem, uh, famous for two things, um, Winston's and Salem's uh, cigarettes. Um, it's the home of RJR. Uh, so we have the remains of RJR still around here. But yeah, I came to teaching, uh, now it's been 11 years. Um, came to teaching after I left newsarama.com, which was a site that uh, I co-founded and ran for 10 years along with a buddy, um, covering comic books, news, games, movies. We were right in the kind of the right place when comics started to hit big um, and really become the pop culture thing that they are now. Um, so it was a really, really exciting time. And, and the internet was new to the industry as well. So they didn't know and hey, do you want to talk to this website? Sure, let's talk to these guys and pick up the phone and, and find yourself talking to somebody that you just, who did I? Wow, wow. My wife still, I think, has uh, fond memories and slash nightmares of Harlan Ellison calling and leaving messages on my machine about that article that went up on the internet and I better adjust it or he has a response that he wants me to take down verbatim. So. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, I, I grew up steeped in uh, pop culture. I had a science background before that. I had a master's in uh, marine biology, and I worked on my PhD in physiology and pharmacology, but writing about comic books was uh, way more interesting than, uh, than yeah. that. So, oh, yeah, but then I started teaching, and um, my school that I got into was a Title I school, and that's its code a little bit. Um, it's a federal program. And your school is Title I if you have a certain percentage that qualifies for free and reduced lunch, which is an indicator usually of both poverty and uh, minority population. And so I 
was happy to, to go into any school. I really, really wanted to teach. Both my parents were teachers and my wife uh, was teaching at that point. And so I went in, eyes wide open. I knew what the students were all about. I kind of knew who the students would be. Um, surprise, surprise, I get in and boy, those, those kids didn't want to have anything to hear, anything <laughs> to do with a middle-aged white guy. And uh, right. so I thought, okay, we've got to find some bridge that we can, uh, we can build between our camps here right. and figure out some way to talk about science. And right about then, the, uh, well, it was before the Marvel movies. Um, mm -hmm. So it was, uh, well, actually, it was just the start of those. And the CW stuff was starting to hit big with Flash and Arrow and stuff like that. And so found that pop culture was our common language. And I really kind of went into that and started using a lot of pop culture references. I think one of the first things I did was a, a velocity worksheet that used the flash as uh, oh, okay. as our example. It wasn't just a, you know, a ball is rolling at four meters per second. It was the flash is running at four meters per second, which is pretty quick. Yeah. Um, and so from there, uh, it just kind of, I used it a lot as a strategy to engage my students. And it gives my students a feeling of ownership that they, they understand, they know, they love the pop culture. Um, and so they, they feel like they own it a bit. So when I go into the science along with it, there's this connection that they have um, that's stronger than, again, just a problem in a book or a problem on a worksheet. Um, mm -hmm. My wife does the same thing. She teaches biology and, uh, we kind of talk about this as the pop culture is the Trojan horse. It, it sneaks in. And while you're comfortable with this idea of this pop culture, boom, here's some science and you're interested because, well, I like the pop culture. Yeah. So I've been doing that. Gosh, now for, yeah, about 10 years, um, in different classes and physics and chemistry and physical science. Uh, my wife and I started the website, the science of.org where, I just write about write articles about the intersection between pop culture and science from a classroom teacher point of view and how could you use this in a classroom uh, and together we work on resources for teachers that want to use this kind of approach as well. So that is what grade what grades are your students these it's, days? It's um at, right now it's uh sophomores and juniors but oh. I have been pretty much sophomores through uh seniors and then yeah, then this fall I'm teaching a, a class at Wake Forest University on science communication, which will be a lot of fun as well. Awesome. You know, I, I love that. I um, I was actually, before I stopped, uh, so I went back to college uh, a little late in life, and I, I got my associates, and I was going for my bachelor's, and I was I had invented, so the school had this thing where you could do inter interdisciplinary degrees. Right, right. So, because you know technology is moving so fast sometimes it's hard to keep up in a college curriculum so you basically take two different degrees and kind of combine them into something like you know medical illustrator or whatever and the one mm -hmm. i was going for was science writer now they have those as a master's level but they don't really have most schools don't have like a bachelor's level science writer and, and i had started out going down that road uh before i got this engineering job and i'm doing all this uh, stuff for the government and everything and I, I do plan to go back it's just i wound up having all this work and didn't have time but um you know, I really love the concept of science writing in that it, it's kind of what you're talking about in that, well, it's exactly what you're talking about in that being able to take these complex things and communicate them to an audience. So mm -hmm. like a specific audience. So if you, uh, you're talking to kids, so pop culture is your, is your vehicle. You know, if you were talking about like a science magazine that the, the general populace was going to read, you could tie it into things that are relevant to like everyday life but you wouldn't you know you wouldn't want to go into the heavy science jargon right because then right. people just they just get lost and they're like i i can't even get the concept because i can't wrap my brain around your examples you know and so you, for instance, something to hook on to you might want to wrap it around something extremely pop culturally uh, relevant right now like like I don't know, rick and morty oh yeah whoa yeah. rick and morty Oh, jeez, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> that was a weekend well spent for you. <laughs> yeah, uh, hey, dub. <laughs> anyway, so, so yeah, so this is a great series out, Rick and Morty, that I got into. So let, let's talk about that. Let's, um, so so what is, what is the, the science of Rick and Morty? What is, this, what is in this book? What, if somebody buys this book, what would, they, what would they be getting? 
Um, well, basically, if you know Rick and Morty, it's a series, irreverent, offensive, philosophical. Uh, did I mention irreverent? Um, right. And offensive. Yeah, I did that one too. Um, but it's got a lot of science in it as well. Um, it goes from having whole episodes that kind of hinge around some science concept uh, to it just being in the background, um, like C-137. Uh, mm -hmm. And so the idea behind the book, well, to, to back things up a bit with the, the website that my wife and I started, the scienceof.org, I had written two articles on uh, Rick and Morty science, one about uh, Tiny Earth, Dwarf Terrace 9, um, and Pickle Rick, and Cockroach Brains, and mm -hmm. Just written them, and like most of the stuff, after after years of running Newsrama and writing to beat the competition and get the news out and under the microscope of the industry and everybody watching, it's just nice to have a place to write where I can just write kind of whatever I want to write. And so I wrote these articles, posted them, thought, well, that was, that was pretty cool, that was fun, and uh, just moved on to whatever caught my interest next. About four months later, this was March of, what is this, 19? March of uh, 18, last year, yeah. Around March of, uh, middle of March last year, uh, I got an email from a guy who said, I found your articles on Rick and Morty science and I thought they were great and I really like how you got it across and your approach to, to getting the science through with the pop culture on it. Would you be interested, interested in writing a book about this? And, and I always have to say, like every good husband, I did what I was supposed to do. I printed out that email. I took it to my wife and said, <laughs> does this look fake to you? Right. And uh, she, she, uh, she checked it out for me and said, no, I, I think it's real. You should probably get in touch with this nice gentleman. And so yeah. I did. And uh, lo and behold, here we are. The book comes out uh, October 1st uh, in the United States. It came out in the UK in May of this year, so May of 19. Um, it was published wow. first in the UK, and okay. so we went with it there. Um, okay, so that's the book that has a slightly different cover. The black cover. Yeah, and slightly different size, too. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about that. I wasn't sure if it was this was a reprinting, or well, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's, it's, I've learned, I thought I knew a bit about publishing. I've learned a lot more about publishing since, uh, since this was done. There's, uh, for the completest out there, there's the UK version, which came out in May. And then since the UK Blink Media was the original publisher, they sold the rights to different markets. Simon & Schuster picked up the rights for the United States market, um, the US market, which we were thrilled about and I am thrilled about. Um, a Polish publisher picked up the rights for a Polish version and there's a Russian version that should be coming out soon. I've seen the cover for the Polish version. I don't know about the Russian version. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's how all that works and every, Every version has its own kind of release date on it. I, I don't think the uh, there will be much celebration about the Polish or Russian version, as I'm <laughs> seeing with, with my media tour now. But uh, yeah. but yeah. yeah. Okay, so Simon and Schuster picked this up, but yet it's still also under Atria Books. Is this like sort of their uh, Atria, subsidiary? Yeah, Atria is the Atria is the, an imprint of Simon and Schuster. Simon and Schuster is the big house. Atria is an imprint um, yeah. of it, and so Atria has publishes books by different folks. Um, the one I like to credit and kind of snuggle, up, snuggle my book up against in my bookcase is uh, it published Adam Savage's book, Every Tool's a Hammer. Oh, nice. and so I've okay. been a huge fan of Adam Savage for years, and I, I named him in the acknowledgments as being a big inspiration. So, oh, nice. So, yeah, oh, nice. yeah, that was pretty cool. Congratulations on getting picked up like this. I know it's, it's big, and we're happy for you. We're happy Thanks. to have you on the show. Um, so if, um, if anyone was wondering, like, what, is this book is definitely a a journey into um, bridging someone's passion, or maybe not not knowing that they had a passion for science and and something having to do with Rick and Morty. But it is not just an obsession on Rick and Morty. It's just sort of it's taking um, concepts and things from their show and then saying, now if you really wanted to do this, or if you wanted to know this, this is really close. This exists today. This doesn't right. exist today. This is what we would need if it was going to exist. Right, right, exactly. That was the original editor um, of the book for the, in the UK. So he was the one who kind of guided me through all this and shaped and helped shape the book. Um, his idea at the very outset was stay very much in tune with what I was doing on the website. That is, 
science was first and foremost. And as we like to say, as we were doing the book, this is a science book. It has Rick and Morty wrapped around it, but it's a science book. Um, it's tuned to the different topics that are brought up by the show. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, that's exactly, you know, kind of what you were saying was what we were going for. Um, and kind of reflective of what I do in my classroom, you know, my classroom, my job is to make science accessible, uh, for my students. And my passion is to make science accessible for everyone. It's not, I, I tell all my students and at the beginning of the semester, I get the eye roll in chemistry of there's no secret knowledge here. There's nothing tricky. It's just you got to understand this piece, then this piece, then this piece. And that's the same way I feel about just about any topic that we cover in there. There are some pieces that can get kind of trippy. Um, but, you know, if, if you look at something like the multiverse chapter, the idea that there are many universes, it's kind of starting to shift in terms of how cosmologists and physicists view it as it, it's probably true. Uh, it's going to be really, really hard, if not impossible, to test. But it right. kind of comes from that idea, that simple idea that if you if you accept this theory and if you accept this theory, then the multiple universe or the multiverse is, uh, you have to go with that as well. And, and I so, think the really cool thing is the kids aren't going to get this. They're not going to realize it. But you're overlapping so many disciplines in order to bring them and bridge them to this concept that they don't even know it, but they've just kind of touched on, you know, uh, biology and chemistry and uh, cosmology. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And on top of that, like a, like a big old coat of paint is just some critical thinking and yeah. some, and some working through problems and understanding of, okay, if I got this and this, then, then I have to have this and this has to be the next step type of thing. Great. Right. And it's and, and a lot of the well, and also ties into the how do we know this is true type of things. Like like this sounds like a crazy, you know, oh yeah, okay, you're making all this up. Like, how do we know this is true? And then you could, you know, it, it opens up the door to go, well, okay, I'm glad you asked that. This is how we know we're right. Exactly. Or, or how we know that we're most likely right. Like it, it's more likely we're right than we're wrong. We can always be wrong. Science always has room to grow and make mistakes. Yep. But the point of the matter is, is that we're as we're more sure that we're right than we are that we could be wrong. You know what I mean? It's right. like, yeah, that's that's all part of critical thinking. If you know, I I, I hope I brought that across properly. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. So I I don't want to just keep talking about the theories and and the reasons for this book. Let's uh, kind of get in, if you don't mind. Can we sure. get in? Yeah. some of the meat and potatoes of it um i just i have one, two, three, four, seven, about four to four, eight eight little topics here and there i wanted to to jump across uh mm -hmm. and before we do is there anything you definitely want to cover or are you okay just with us jumping stuff jumping around i'm pretty much game on anything okay, let's cool. let's jump in all right um so all right well i guess my first question is in your opinion First, before we touch on specific topics, what does, uh, what are the like two or three things that Rick and Morty most get gets the most right in in their series? What what sciences? What what even small fields or partial? I I know there's sometimes it it, it could take that and at any given point extrapolate out beyond comprehension. Yeah, but yeah, you know, in, in in some in in your opinion, what 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 did they get like mostly right? Mostly right. Um, there, there are small things that, like the small things that exist now that we have, uh, breathable liquid um, that he that Rick put into Fruity Land for Beth so she couldn't drown if she ever fell into the water. Um, <laughs> sorry, water. Uh, <laughs> we have we have that kind of stuff. Um, if you're, I don't know. I think all of us of of this generation probably maybe saw that picture of a mouse upside down in liquid. And it was okay, and we were haunted by that for years. Um, right. That stuff's real. That stuff's real, and it does exist. It's it's got its problems because we can't breathe it in and out that well because our lungs were made for breathing air, not liquid. Um, so we have to have some kind of helpful push back and forth, like a, a rebreather or a ventilator on it. Um, but that stuff's real. Uh, so there's little bits here and there that are real. Um, there's some neat approaches uh, that they take to different things. Um, but by and large, a lot of the science in Rick and Morty is 
it's, it's hints at stuff. It's mm -hmm. hints at what could be. And it takes it kind of like you were saying, it takes it and extrapolates it. It has a firm footing on kind of the idea of it and then goes forward with it. Um, the, the simulation, um, what if you're living in, are we living in a simulation? And that, that <laughs> kind of stuff. Stay there. <laughs> but mm -hmm. if you, if you just, if you watch the episode with the Zygerians, when they're trying to get the recipe for concentrated dark matter or the Roy game and blips and shits, um, yeah or the other, there's one other example of being in a simulation. Um, that's pretty cool. And then maybe if you scratch that questioning itch you have after you see, uh, see an episode and start to look at it, it gets real weird real fast. That mm -hmm. uh, there's the, the idea or the theory that, you know, as humans that we will live long enough to create uh, software that can completely make a believable simulation for the creatures living in it. We will not get there or we just won't want to do that. Um, one of those has to be true. We'll the not get there. We'll kill ourselves. We'll destroy ourselves or kill ourselves, make ourselves go extinct. And one of those has to be true. And it's, you know, the, the one that's more than likely true. And there's some argumentative, hurdles that are jumped through or jumped over with this. But the one that's leans to be most likely true is that we could be living in a simulation and mm -hmm. we'd never know it. And that's okay in the end. But the fact that there are physicists who are discussing that and the possibility and, and like the good physicists, not the physicists who are, you know, going outside and, and catching a ride on the UFO to go home at night. But these right. are, these are the serious ones who have, you know, checks, paychecks with nice school names on them. Yeah. Um, and there, you know, there's, there's some ideas of, well, here's how we could check to see if there's some part of the code of our simulation, if, if it's being sloppy, if it's, if it was created by something that was finite, not infinite, um, this is how we could see it. And it just, it gets weird. And so that's, I think that's, that's the the most fun of the science in Rick and Morty is just okay. What did they do here? Well, right. what what's that like? You know yeah. what mm -hmm. they they kind of took they they planted their feet and on a firm ground and then said we're going to do this story about this. We need this in the story, so we're going to go a little bit nuts here. And the entire premise of this show uh, just parallel universes or uh, multiple multiverses. Um, it, it, in and of itself is just crazy. Um, and one of the things, and I, I swear I had to hold this, but I, I got to know, do you know anything? Because I just am dying to know what, if anything, could there be as far as a central finite curve? And what the hell is an iteration off of it, right? I, <laughs> I get from the idea that, because he says it, so many times, usually cursing around it, that he's the rickest Rick that there is, that yeah. our Rick 137 is the rickest Rick that there is. And the other Ricks, you know, of, of the whole group of them tend to defer to him or defer or fear him because yeah. he knows everything and he can, he can figure out what they're going to do before they've even started. Look at the Rick Shank redemption. He, he yeah. had his whole, his whole escape plan figured out as well as every turn where it could go wrong. Um, yeah. And so kind of what I got from that and adding the, the 137, which is our fine structure constant, which we see in our universe over and over again, where we look at these uh, measurements, um, which can get really strange. Um, but that 137 identifies our universe. There's no reason why other universes would have that same fine structure constant. And so kind of a normal distribution, I believe in the book somewhere, there is a graph of just a normal distribution, the, the bell curve. And if you put 137 in the middle, and then you get, you know, out farther and farther away from that curve where you have doofus Rick who might be way away from the, the peak of that, that curve um, to the ones who are just not so far away that they're still up there and, you know, can give Rick 137 a, a challenge in terms of thinking and, and action and plans. 
So right. I think they've never really been that explicit talking about it. Um, but, you know, going back with what you, you were asking about the science of it, you know, 137 was there from the start, pretty much. It's universe 137. It's Rick 137 and Morty 137 and summer 137. Right. And that was just left there as a Easter egg, as a, you know, a mystery, as something for the fans to figure out. And sure enough, the fans, you know, okay, well, how does this make sense? What does 137 actually mean? And you know, I had a, I had a point in my watching it before I really started digging into it. I was just like, well, 137 was the, ep- it was the issue of Uncanny X-Men where Phoenix died. Maybe they're just comics fans. Right. Oh, okay. That one was not right. That was not no. right at all. <laughs> so now that's, that's interesting. Well, hold on, Mike, real quick. Because, you know, they're – and, you know, it's spoiler alert. I, I, I don't care because if you're watching this show and, the, the you know, season three ended, what, two years ago or I, I whatever it was? Been. So, the statute's gone. Yeah, statue's gone. So when, you know, early in season one, you know, Rick and Morty lose their world and they go to another universe and that's, yep. they're living in that universe now. And then there is an episode where we're not totally sure if he's got the right Morty. You know, like, remember, the, yep. they go to this, he yeah. leaves Morty Which off and just like... Uh, that, one. Yeah, that one. Yeah, <laughs> right. So he may or may not have the Morty he started with. Right. Right. <laughs> What I love about this show is is the moral. I, I don't want to dig into the moral implications of any of this stuff because that's a whole show in itself. Uh, oh, yeah. Just some of the stuff like is Rick sadistic or is he justified in his sadism or it, whatever. But at any rate, it's just funny how he's like, yeah, well, whatever. And he takes takes that Morty. So, but it, but it, it's interesting to to note that Earth one. Um, I'm sorry. Was it one thirty seven? One thirty seven. One thirty seven. Right. Sorry. I'm, that, for some reason, sixty seven was sticking in my head. But one thirty seven, they're not on that Earth anymore. No, they right. destroyed that Earth. Yep. What are they on now? Did they say? Has it ever been hinted? I don't think they've named it. Um, but yeah, it was 137 went down in uh, in Rick Potion number nine. That was yeah. early on in the first yeah. season yep. of just they had to get out of there. Then there was the, I mean, and they've jumped a couple times as well. Yeah. Um, there was the episode in uh, Morty's Mindbenders where he started listening to the squirrels. And right. they screwed it up and they had, they had to, to just, leave again. they had to jump out. And so, right. yeah, I, I think they, they kind of change Earths, um, you know, pretty much almost as we change, you know, buy a new pair of shoes or something like that. He said, there's only a few times that we can do this. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yep. Yeah. Which is, so that's, funny. that's, it's one of those things that kind of like, again, it's that, that little story bit, but it's this bigger, bigger idea that if, you know, the, the, cosmologists that, that will argue these things about the multiverse. Is it finite? Is there a set number of universes or is there an infinite number of universes if we live in this multiverse or are there multiverses within multiverses, which then it just goes insane. Um, but there's, you know, kind of two camps where it's a very, very, very large number that to us would be effectively infinite or infinite, an infinite number of, of universes. And, that whole concept, uh, it kind of, you know, I, I try to get that across in the book um, because, you know, aside from maybe math class in high school or, you know, wherever you learn the idea of infinity and you draw the, you know, the eight on its side uh, and for all the 10 minutes, you think you're cool doing that. Um, if you sit down and think about the concept of infinity, it, it, it's, it's kind of, it's not something we do every day. Yeah. And it, it's like if, there are, if there's an infinite number of multiverses, if there are an infinite number of parallel universes, okay, well, then how many universes are there where there's an exact copy of Earth as we know it? An infinite number because there's right. an infinite number. So there's an infinite number of copies of Earth. How many copies of Earth are there where we are all fish? And right now we're talking this and, and bubbles are coming out of our mouth. An infinite number. An infinite number. Right. And then, well, how many, and in the Rick and Morty case, how many no, numbers, how many Earths are there where a second ago, Rick and Morty just died and we can jump over there and take their place and no one will know? An infinite number. Well, right. but evidently yeah. not. 
There is a finite number. <laughs> that, that, the, the, the curve, yes, the curve. Wait a minute, hold I, on. Rick, Rick clearly did not say there are an infinite number of worlds and we could jump to them. He said there are only a finite number we can jump to or right. we can do right. this. So right. there may be an infinite number of them, but there may be a very strict finite number that right. he can right. jump to. There, uh, Yeah. True, true. Right. <laughs> I, I'm kind of blending the science science with the Rick and Morty science with what has right. been established sure. in that universe. Yeah. And so if you go back to the, the central curve or the curve, then yeah, there's that they kind of, I believe Justin Roiland kind of hinted that at the ends of that bell curve, things just kind of go down into static and uselessness. Right. And it, it doesn't really, you, you could jump there, but you wouldn't want to yeah. be there. I, it's like, I guess when you talk about there are there's only one universe where everything is exactly the same, and then the next universe over there's like small tweaks. So I would imagine in this other universe where all of the Rick and Mortys, you know, or the Rick and Morty died at that exact time where they can sneak in at the time yeah. that they need to sneak in. There's a finite amount of those along the curve. Right, and then Mike, you can get in, you get in, you get into all kinds of stuff. You get into what what do we have? Like we have like. I forget what it is like right-handed proteins or left-handed proteins or whatever. And you, you could go to a world that has the opposite right, and they look exactly right. the same and they're made out of the exact same stuff, but something about the, the DNA of them is a, is a different direction. DNA and it curls the other way. Yeah. Yeah. It, it would be incompatible with our system and could be poisonous to us or non-nutritious or whatever. I, I don't know. I, I don't think they'd know cause I don't think they've ever detected that cause we don't have any of that on earth. Right. But yeah. It's conceivable. It could exist. Yep. So yeah. Yeah. All right, and and uh, that kind of leads the other question. Uh, well, no, we just we we covered that all that whole infinite finite versions, um, and quantum theory. Obviously, I mean that was the one of the best episodes too, where they were just talking about the uh, you know uh, Schrodinger's cat and just the split, split and split and split and split. And split. Yep. <laughs> yeah, the uncertainty. And the universe just has cats floating around in it. Yeah, were, yeah. Schrodinger's <laughs> yeah. cats floating out in limbo, who are neither dead nor alive. Yep. Schrodinger's yeah. cats, or are they? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's see. So we yeah, have quantum theory basics. They got that. Or you know, I mean, obviously, they pretty much nailed that. Now wormholes. Like you know, we've we talk about the fact that conceivably wormholes can exist. We've almost gotten to the point where we can measure them. We do, or wait, where we can have, we haven't, we, no, no, where we can conceive that they would, could be measured. I'm sorry, that they could be yeah. measured under the right circumstances. If we can uh, find them, if we can yeah, find them, under the right maths. Uh, yeah. I'm thinking Farscape, Farscape, they exist perfectly. Fine. <laughs> oh no crossovers, no crossovers, right, no <clears throat> crossing streams, Mike. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, but that said, uh, the biggest problem is being able to. Uh, magnetically stabilize, or however you would gravitationally stabilize this the thing. Energy, the yeah. energy yeah. required. The energy required for the entire energy in a in a, one of the universes, for God's sake. Right, right. Well, that's wormholes, and and with wormholes, I kind of use that to explain the portal gun. Um, that right. you could either punch a hole through to a different universe or just punch a hole through to a different portion of your own universe. And those would be the blue or green, depending on your, your destination, um, the circles that show up. And uh, wormholes are one of those fascinating things that it's, I think the, the, well, I mean, to start with wormholes and black holes kind of, same category, same family, but black holes were theorized and all the formulas said, yeah, these things should exist. Um, these things really should be out there. This is the end result of what could happen. And sure enough, when we go out there and, and look for one, we can find the evidence of one for the longest time, think we see them, find the evidence. And then this spring, actually, we're able to take an image of one. Um, yeah. Oh, and by the way, between the uh, the publication of the version in the UK and the publication in the US, we took the picture of the first black hole. So if you get yes. the UK version, I sound a bit dumb because I don't know if we'll ever find get a picture. Or I say we should soon get a picture of a black hole, but in the US version, I said, we just got one. Nice. Um, <laughs> but 
wormholes wormholes kind of find fall in that same category in that the theory and this is you know relativity that we're talking about special relativity in general that they suggest they should exist they should be out there they should be allowed if they're if they're not expressly ruled out by Einstein's theories, then they probably are out there somewhere. Uh, we just haven't found them yet and we haven't seen them. But so first, yeah, we've got to find them, prove that they actually exist, then characterize them in the real world a little better. Um, but then, yeah, as we were saying, propping them open, uh, the, the ideas of how they, how they open up um, and how long they're open and what's going on you know, if they're actually connected to something else, uh, that's all just ideas right now. I mean, there are some brilliant, brilliant physicists. Uh, well, Kip, once we find them, all we're going to need is one of these bands. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that that good. that portal gun there. That was a little bit of hand waving on what could be possible someday, but that someday is probably so right. far in the future to make it right. impossible by our standards. And, there's, and, look, there's so many pieces of this. Like, okay, so you're going to make a wormhole that'll get you to this other place, right? You need all the energy or whatever it's going to require for that, yep. right? And then you have to make sure that you don't get destroyed by either some kind of gr gravitic pull on yourself as you pass through it or, or radiation that radiation it gives can, off or, you know. Yep. I mean, got to well, prop it open with the, the – thread it the, with the exotic matter. Right, and, yeah, exactly. yeah. That's what the exotic matter is for, Pete. Yeah, Oh, sorry. forgot. But, oh, but that stuff, I mean, we sound like we're just, we sound like we're trying out for a slot in the Rick and Morty writer's room, but that's, there are books worth of this stuff, again, written by those, the, the real deal guys, uh, men and women who have just, you know, spent their lives trying to figure these things out. Um, the name that keeps always jumping to my mind when I think wormholes is Kip Thorne, who good friend of Carl Sagan and gave Sagan the idea of wormholes for his novel contact. And then Kip Thorne's idea uh, became for his own kind of story in space became interstellar um, with a wormhole type of effect there through the back black hole. Um, Gargantua or Gargantua was the black hole. Um, but yeah, Thorne has written large, large amounts on wormholes and what they could be like and how they could be propped open and how for a long time he didn't think they'd exist. And then, no, they went back to the theory and formula and saw, no, they actually could exist. And so, yeah, it's just, again, this is one of those things that you get that hint of it in Rick and Morty and just go, I'm going to look into this a little. Whoa. And you're, <laughs> you know, right I tell on. my kids every now and then I'll tell my kids that uh, in chemistry that we'll have a stoner thought. And they all laugh. And I'm like, no, no, really, this is a stoner thought. And we talk yeah. about, okay, where did the elements come from? Where did the, right. the gold that's in your necklace, where did that come from? Those, <laughs> those gold atoms came from a star, not just star. any star. It had to be an exploding star, so a supernova yeah. star. And it's been probably in many, many pieces of jewelry since it was first dug out of the ground thousands of years ago. And they just right. kind of stop mm -hmm. and just, whoa. Yeah. We are. Yeah. We are stardust. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. All right. So, uh, why do, I don't. I don't want to shift gears per se, but I want to touch on a couple of topics. And you tell me not not that Rick and Morty get, got wrong. I don't. I don't think it's fair to say that because, like, I agree with you. They pretty much got a lot of stuff right, even if it's just a a, a long extrapolation. Right. Uh, on a, on, on it's an idea. feasible, Mike. Feasible. <laughs> feasibility. But let's talk about how close are we to dot, dot, dot. Okay. So, it, and, and these are genuinely, obviously, your thoughts. And, and these are things that are touched upon in the book, I'm, I'm pretty sure, too. Like uh, love potions. Uh, and and to, to that extent, genetically targeted medicine. You know, how close are we to love potions slash genetically targeted medicines. I would I would err on the side that we're closer to genetically targeted medicine than we are to love potions. Oh, um, yeah. Wouldn't that be just a sorry. genetically targeted medicine? Right? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, some of the, the cutting-edge cancer therapies these days are 
you know, so successful because they, they take into account the, the DNA of the, the cancer itself. There's so many different kinds of cancer. It's, you know, when we say, oh, we're, you know, we're fight cancer, well, which one, which type? Which one? Uh, yeah. yeah. And Thousands how, this type points. is different than the one in that person, even though they go by the same name. Um, so we're getting very close to that. Uh, we have a couple, we have the comprehensive cancer clinic here at, at Wake Forest. It's part of um, Baptist Hospital complex that does tremendously good things um, on that front. Um, as for uh, Love Potion, um, <laughs> the way the Rick made it, ah, boy, I love that episode for so Love many Potion. reasons. Like we were talking Love about Potion. earlier, <laughs> they got they got kicked off their earth pretty because they Cronenberged it. Um, yeah. but uh, <laughs> they, uh, so but I love that. One of the things I love most about that episode is. Rick was just so wrong. Yeah. Everything he did was wrong. And yeah. it, it's one of those very few episodes where, you know, you're, if you watch the whole season or the whole series and you look at everything and you go, you know, he's, he's usually right to the point that sometimes you do start to think, you start to buy into his, you know, in, into his praise of just like, no, he is God in this. He was so wrong in that yeah. episode. He, it wasn't Morty. It was, you know, yeah, she had the flu, but then every time he tried to fix it, it was just, Oh, Oh geez. Oh, you know, what, you know what it reminded me of? It reminded me of, uh, of combat combating, uh, a, a pest with a invade, with, like with a species, right? <laughs> it's like, yep. Oh, yep. we have too many rats. Bring in some cats. Ah, oh, shit. Now we got too many cats. Bring in some dogs. Right. And my wife and I have that same joke, and we always say it always ends with tigers. It yeah. always ends with tigers, and you just don't want to do that. You go down that road, and it ends with yep. tigers. Right. Tiger clams. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep. exactly, exactly. Um, so, okay, how about so – Mike, hey, hey, Mike, real quick, I'm going to be the bad guy. Yeah, Can yeah. Check? Just to make sure. Okay, okay, all right. Check. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, d d d God damn it. I want to, uh, right, I'm going to mention three things and you tell me which one you want to talk about, okay? Okay. All right. We got brain wave detection slash, brain, you know, like thought imaging, which is obviously prominent in the show. Uh, alien human hybrids. Let's talk carbon versus non carbon based. Um, or sh uh, shrinking versus embiggening. I'm calling it embiggening. Hashtag Simpsons uh, <laughs> uh, and the distance between atoms. So, what? Uh, which one of those do you want to tackle real quick? Ooh, um, we could do the shrinking versus embiggening. Okay. I guess that's been used a couple times, obviously, in the mm -hmm. series. Um, both of those, um, I, 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 I like. I like them, uh, and they had to include them, even though they can stay. As we've said, they can can stay pretty close to science and you know show a healthy respect for science um but but uh, shrinking people and making people bigger problematic so so problematic just for so many reasons so um, many reasons so many reasons that uh even just a little bit bigger small bigger t you know taller shorter um you start to see health problems start to kick in on, on just regular humans. And I get it. They had to include it. It's, it's a science fiction trope. You have to include it. If you're going to do something that a series that, that touches on science fiction, sometime you have to do the shrinking and growing people. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, as you said, if you shrink people, okay, we're going to, we're going to make this person, you know, half size. Okay. Well, where does that extra mass go? Yes, go well, right. if you don't do anything with the mass, then you have all that mass and you're, in a smaller volume then your density's increased. And there's a there's a great comic out there, fake comic out there that says if, you know, if Neil deGrasse Tyson wrote comics and it's the character shrinks down to the size of an atom and does it on a guy's palm and immediately just shoots right through his shoots palm and down into the center of the earth and can't come back because he's too dense. So Right. Yeah. Yeah. And he slips between molecules so he's got nothing to resist and right. yeah. Right. Right. Yep. Right. And then if you're if you're larger that's the the King Kong problem. The you just blow away, actually. Yeah, well, if you, didn't, if you didn't increase mass, you just blow if you, away. yeah. But if you do increase your mass, your all your bones are breaking when you take a step, yeah. and right. and that's the that's the the one thing, and kind of I guess to get that message out to anybody who might be on the fence about buying this book, and just like, oh shit, I don't want to buy a book that tells me, you know, none of this is real, and you're stupid if you believe in it. No, it's not that at all, <laughs> and I. I, I can't stand when people do that myself. I have some right. I have some definite beefs with Neil deGrasse Tyson when he kind of goes down that alley for some cheap laughs. 
Um, but uh, this is this is not raining on anybody's parade. This is talking about the science, the science behind it. Does the science allow this? Well, no, it doesn't. But yet we have some really big animals. How do right. we have really big animals? How do we have an elephant when you know you say, oh, you can't grow something up really big? Well, you know, look at an elephant's legs they're they're tree trunks and that's what they'd have to be you can't you can't have human proportioned ankles if you're going to be 60 feet tall they would snap right the first step you took they would just break um and so that's again that's the, the what, my passion for what i do in this book and what i do in the classroom what i do on the website is to bring science to these things not to ruin them not to take the fun away but just to get people thinking about science that that yeah. pop culture is that trojan horse and once you're open to the idea that hey there's some science here well, let's talk about some real science yeah oh, awesome man. didn't even get to cover cockroach brains damn it cockroach, cockroach brains are real cockroach brains are real you can do that y'all oh, you can <laughs> do that there's a company backyard brains in ann arbor michigan that you can you can take a cockroach and you snip off its antenna you put electrodes down in each antenna and then you rubber cement or just to cement this, I guess it'd be rubber cement, this little backpack onto them that has a power source. And it's, you have an app. And so you can push one side of the app and it sends a stimulus down into the cockroach antenna stump that makes it think that there's something bad on this side. And so it'll go the other way. And uh -huh. so you can drive a cockroach with an app on your phone. That oh is God, totally awesome. real. Totally that's real. Nice. And it's like... <laughs> And you can do that, and, and while it sounds really gross, and, and I urge everyone, it's Backyard Brains is the name of the company. Um, the guys have given TED Talks. They're really, really cool guys. Um, but, uh, you know, so that's the idea. But the idea of cockroach brains isn't just to be gross and creepy. The idea is to understand how these things work. And there's a, a robot that's been developed by the Army or contracted for the Army called the CRAMS, T-R-A-M, robot that's modeled after a cockroach. And if you think about a cockroach, it can wedge itself through a small opening. That's what this robot can do. It's modeled after a cockroach. It can wedge itself through, but it's got cameras. It's got microphones. It can go into a building that's collapsed and find survivors. And so wow, that's cool. end of the day, cockroach brains. Yeah, you can manipulate cockroach brains externally. <laughs> Kind of how gross, crazy! But, how crazy would it be if you took like fifty of those cockroaches, right, and you lined them up and you had them all connect on the same app? So when you sent the signal, it went to all of them, and you were walking like down the sidewalk with like fifty of these cockroaches just marching in front of you. That would be pretty crazy. <laughs> you'd, you'd probably get some calls. You'd, uh, you'd probably yeah. Yeah. somebody would call somebody on you. And you're talking about a mass hysteria. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh. Or just have them do the thriller dance or something. Right, yeah. <laughs> two oh, steps like, over. Two steps over. Right. <laughs> all right. right. And I cannot <laughs> thank you enough for talking to us about all this stuff. And, Pete, we cannot screw this up, man. We have got to have Matt back on. He yeah. is yes. he love our to. people. He is our people. We, yeah, yeah love to talk more about this talk about all kinds of stuff and you seem yep. like we haven't even been able to touch uh all kinds of other geeky uh goodnesses so um you are definitely not that you know you're gonna play our game we're, we're gonna switch the game <laughs> in a second but uh you are definitely welcome back uh we would love to yeah have i'd love to come back Hey, and real quick, before we do the game, Mike, make yeah. sure everybody you go to thescienceof.org and check yep. out Matt's webpage. Uh, and then what is this? Uh, what is this? Uh, was this lab, laboutloud.com? That's uh, Mike. They did an interview with me. Yeah. yeah, yeah okay. That, that was just uh, that. That wasn't meant to be with the. You you put that down there. Your fault. No, never mind. <laughs> no, it's but it's in the it, it's it's in the links if, if you want to go read it. So, uh, yeah, that is, that's great, man. Awesome. Uh, man, couldn't even talk about, uh, uh, what is that? Aber, Aberdorf Linkler. <laughs> <laughs> so yep. No, and we yep. didn't even get to talk about the parasite one. That was my favorite episode. I think the oh, yeah. parasite with oh, the, the memory, memory thing. Yeah. That yeah, was recall. really cool. Yep. That was such yep. a good science fiction oh, story. Just a you, straight up yep. good science fiction story. If you read the, read the book, the chapter about memories and, okay. uh, it's, it's interesting and creepy and scary at the same time of how pliable memories are yes. and how that parasite was just totally exploiting how soft yes. our memories are. As you remember things, 
you can change that and, memory. And if you give the brain a believable fact, even yep. if it's not fact, it will make a story up to mm -hmm. make that real. Yep. Yep. The brain it's, is real good at making stories. Yep. All right. Well, let's see how good both of your brains are <laughs> with yeah. finding numbers. Uh, okay. Do you have to run any music or anything? Nah, Peter? just go ahead. Go ahead. All go right. Ahead. Good. Good. So basically, I have just a science trivia, science facts trivia for you guys. I'm going to read an interesting fact, and I'm going to have omitted one of um, the the numbers and I will ask you to within um, a reasonable amount of uh, digits I will tell you to you know see if either of you can compete for the closest for the cl answer. Okay. okay for that uh, so uh, we'll just start with number one um, <clears throat> the human microbiome project are you guys familiar with that both of you is that uh, what that that uh, gut that bacteria bio biodome no, no? <laughs> I don't think that's it. Don't microbiome know. is uh, guts, gut is bacteria living with us. Well, no, no. He said the microbiome project is uh, it concluded that microbes uh, contribute more genes responsible for human survival than humans contribute. Yeah. Okay. So in other words, they, they, they looked at all of the, the, the genetic material that's on our bodies that's not us. Um, and that's the that's called the micro. I guess what the microbiome. Uh, microbiome. Microbiome. Bi yeah, yeah. Bio. Thank you. It's yeah. in the book. <laughs> that to me. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so the uh, the human microbiome project uh, concluded microbes contribute more genes responsible for human survival than humans contribute. Where the human genome carries some twenty two thousand protein coding genes. Researchers estimate that the human microbiome uh, contributes some blank million unique protein coding genes. So that would be about 360 times more bacterial genes than human genes. So uh, we'll start with uh, Matt. Uh, if it's uh, basically it's a, a one one digit million if you want to get gander a guess at how many million um uh, i'm gonna go with uh seven all right that is met with seven and peter I, my I, my first thought was five i'm gonna go with five okay pete with five and that would be 360 times more bacterial genes than human genes that is eight million so uh, that is that for the win Hey, Matt, you get one of these. Oh, oh, <laughs> I like those. That's great. <laughs> Pete gave you a dinger. All right. <laughs> yeah, Pete got one of these. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not going to do that every time. So, <laughs> all right. And number two, uh, Pete, you get the answer first. According okay. to a subsequent study released in January of 2013, human breast milk alone can have up to how many hundred species of bacteria oh hmm peter how much hundreds of bacteria does human contain just are you going to give me digits on this one or do you just have to guess well I, uh, it is within the hundreds single hundreds okay so it's it's in single hundreds okay Wow, how many? Oh, God. Uh, I always thought it was sterile, but I guess not. Um, I'm going to say 200. Oh. 200. 200. All right. And Matt? I was going to say around there, too, but since he went there, I'm going to have to go higher. Um, four. 400. 400. Matt, going higher. Gave you the win with 700. <laughs> Jesus. Really? Hold on. Stop. Stop. You know <laughs> 700,000. 700, no, 700 species of bacteria. Okay. How many hundreds of species of bacteria? 700. Got to get that baby's immune system up and running. That's right. Yeah, I, guess so. I guess so. All right. Well, they, they get it from somewhere. So, yep. okay. So makes sense. Right. Well, the baby's born sterile. They get the bacteria from the mom's milk, right? Aren't they born sterile? No. I mean, gut bacteria. Their gut bacteria. Is, their there's, guts are there's plenty of bacteria. In their guts already? Present. Okay. All right. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Well, you know, During birth, there's plenty of bacteria coming around there. 
That's oh no, no, I meant like in their in their guts, in their in their in their job. guts. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, and now you know. All right, Peter. Yes. This uh, we have a, a couple of. Oh no, this will be for Matt. He answers first. Uh, there's two questions related to the Eiffel Tower. Okay, the Eiffel Tower is approximately 300 meters tall. However, due to heat expansion during the summer, it can grow as much as blank centimeters taller, and it would be in the uh, the, the tens. It's, yeah, yeah the tens of centimeters. Sure. Oh, I knew this. I knew this. Oh, um, it's like frightening that it does this in a way, but it doesn't do it all at once, so you don't notice. It's just like, whoop. yeah. Um, oh my God, could you imagine? That'd be weird. <laughs> uh, I'm stuck between two ranges. Uh, let's go with sixty centimeters. 60 centimeters. And Peter. 60. God damn, that, that's like tens of feet. Um, 60 centimeters? Isn't it two and a half inches per centimeter? 60. I don't know. I can't, I can't, I can't math right now. Uh, I'm going to say 25. I'm just going to throw that out there. Sounds like a good All number. Right. <laughs> okay. 25 centimeters. Yeah. Uh, Peter. Yeah, uh, and because you can, we can go over. Technically, it's going to be whoever's closest, since there's only two of you. Right. Uh, it, it is 15 centimeters tall. Oh, okay. So uh, that's that, Peter. Hey, give hey, a ding. Huh? I give myself a ding. Okay, I'll do that. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Pete, now uh, this is your first answer on on the mm -hmm. the next Eiffel Tower question. This one, it's a toughie. So listen carefully. Yeah, they've all uh, been pretty easy. <laughs> yeah, 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 I know. <laughs> the Eiffel Tower is comprised of eighteen thousand parts, individual parts, connected by two point five million rivets. Okay, that's that's seven thousand three hundred tons of wrought iron. Every seven years, they paint it, and the weight of the tower increases. By how many tons? This is again in tens of ton tens of tons. How many tens of tons does the, the weight of the Eiffel Tower increase when it is painted? I don't know, but a five gallon bucket's pretty damn heavy. You ever carry one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Wait. Like, uh, fuck tens of tons. I, uh, the three three tens of tons, so thirty tons. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for uh, doing that. All right, so thirty oh, yeah. tons. And Matt, I think I'm going to go back up to my higher numbers. Uh, fifty. All right, Matt says fifty tons, and the correct answer it increases by approximately, and I guess it depends on who's rolling that day. Sixty <laughs> tons. Whoa! Congratulations, Matt. Whoa! <laughs> Right, I know. <laughs> Sixty tons of paint. <laughs> you can use some of these in your class to give people scale, like ideas of scale. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, all right, uh, here we go. This is number five, uh, and uh, here we got Matt is the first answer. Okay, Matt. Every year, Hawaii is hurling at breakneck speed toward Alaska. <laughs> Actually, it's moving at a rate of how many centimeters per year? <laughs> twelve. You say twelve centimeters a year. It's and in the tens, Mike? Peter. Huh? What what range is it in? It's in the tens. Yeah, in the, the the ones of tens of uh yeah. One, between one and ninety nine. One and nine. Okay, gotcha. Okay, uh, I'll say thirty-two. Thirty-two centimeters per year. Wow, that'd be too high. <laughs> 30, thirty-two <laughs> centimeters a year. That'd be like uh, how many miles a decade? No. Um. Not so, <laughs> <laughs> correct answer, uh, Matt. You get it at uh, seven point five centimeters a year. Oof. So, is it yeah. something equivalent to like how fast nails grow or something like that? That's isn't. 
I think, or uh, I think the Atlantic is growing by that much. I think. Yeah, I think that's cool. the one. Yeah, I've heard that before. And they're like, yeah, in a few million years, it'll be touching this other thing, and it gives you an idea of just how long a yeah. million years is. Until yeah. it hits the Pacific garbage patch, then uh, then all bets are off. <laughs> Actually, that is going to save the continents from smashing into each other, and it's going to be a be bumper. Giant. <laughs> it's going to be like a bumper. They're going to bounce back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, so, saving ourselves. Saving ourselves. <laughs> one, one plastic bag at a time. All, All right. right. So uh, our next time, question. Mike, one straw at a time. <laughs> our, our next our next question, uh, Pete, uh, I think you get the first one. That's right. right? Okay. Um, yep. That is has to do with photons. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it takes a photon. 40,000 years to travel from the core of the sun to the surface. Not according to the photon. Mm -mm. (laughs) True. (laughs) However, it takes how many minutes and seconds for light to travel from the sun to the earth? Well, seven minutes. I can't remember how many seconds it is, but I know it's seven minutes. So you're going to say seven minutes. Seven odd. At least I think I know. Seven point. So you're going with seven uh, minutes. Seven point zero. Okay. And Matt. Uh, I'm gonna go with eight and a little change. Okay, you're gonna go with eight and uh, what do you just just for shits and giggles? Give me a change. Uh, eight and eight minutes twenty five seconds. Eight minutes twenty five seconds. Oh, you're just a scant over. It's eight minutes, 19 seconds, but you. <laughs> Damn it. Damn it. That was seven seconds. Man, oh. it's almost like he's a teacher. He knows this yeah, stuff. Like <laughs> hey, I was close. I was only a second off. You were, buddy. You did good. <laughs> All hey, right. Light speed, that's only a few hundred thousand miles. Yeah. Funny you didn't mention light speed. We're, we're bringing it down a little bit from light speed, but Matt. Uh, a jumping flea can reach heights of about three inches in a millisecond, while the space shuttle can peak at around five Gs. Fleas can experience about how many hundred Gs? How fa- how how high? Three inches, you said. Yes. Three inches in a millisecond. So it's three inches in a millisecond. Would- <laughs> <laughs> You're only going to get X, of X uh, time for math. <laughs> uh, I want to. Uh, oh, it's late on a Monday. My brain's not working. I think hey, that would be right. around somewhere in the 20s, 20 G's or higher. 20 G's. You're going to go with 20 G's. Yeah, ballpark 20. Okay. 20 G's. Oh, jeez. Pete, <laughs> stay there, buddy. Please, Mike, I'm going to go with 10 Gs. You're going to go with 10 Gs. Yeah, I have, I have no idea. All <laughs> right. Uh, well, it's like, like a spring-like thing, and it bow. I mean, uh, I guess both of you didn't exactly hear the clue when I said how many hundreds of Gs. Oh, oh. Oh. So well, I'm going to let you both uh, modify your answers if you just want to add a zero to those, or if yeah, you would like. Nine. Um. Yeah, I can't do the math right now. <laughs> three <laughs> inch. Oh. Three inch. No, I can't. Um. Yeah. <laughs> add uh, add a zero to mine. 200. Okay. All right. So, uh, Matt, you're a little bit off. Pete, you just had dumb luck with adding a zero to yours. <laughs> 100 Gs. 100 Gs. I want you to imagine that 5 Gs. 5 Gs is enough to put someone, you know, what, 5, 6 Gs is like yeah. you can put one to sleep, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, you have to have the special compression suits and all that stuff. Oh, 100 Gs. Oh, my God. So yeah, that's a lot. Bag of pudding at the end of that. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you're a flea, because they have yeah. special skeletal things. things. Uh, right. and they're small, like you know that whole like large scale, small scale thing we talked yeah. about earlier. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. Oh yeah, but well, I guess an elephant. Oh my god, could you elephant imagine? Do that. 
<laughs> first to get an elephant to 100 Gs, not, a, not to mention the mess on the back of the shuttle, but still. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not it was his first flight, too. He was so proud. His parents were so happy. <laughs> he's not dumb. coming home. <laughs> or well, he's coming home, but like in a hefty yeah. bag. Right. Well, after, after seven, I got to say, uh, the score, uh, Matt has four. Pete, you have three. And uh, that was basically, that was the end. I have a tiebreaker, but uh, we need a good one. place to end it. <laughs> yeah, hey, Matt, it's what? You get. <laughs> That's Not only you have a book coming out, but you just won a game on the Mythwits. Woo! Yeah, that, that's all we got for you. Sorry. <laughs> I right. hear it every year. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I figured you'd get a kick out of that. Um, all right, so that's it, man. Uh, good good yeah. game. Yeah. Uh, you got to come back on. This, this yes, good. definitely. Got to through all this. Definitely. Now. All right. Yeah, anytime, just let me know. All right, everybody. Make sure, make sure you check out the scienceof.org um, and get Matt's book. comes out tomorrow uh, yep. if you're watching this tonight. Woo! Science of Rick and Morty. Um, Mike, have you look, you've read through, th through uh, you read through some of that already, right? Yeah, yeah I'm, I've I started jumping around because I, when I got a quarter of the way through, I realized there's so much more I want to read that is more you know uh, that I I wanted to have for the show. So right, yes. and and you wanted to take it in at the right speed, right? You're gonna be like, oh, I'm reading too fast, you know. <laughs> oh, well, also, you know, uh, I am a audible reader. Uh, so, and I thought, oh, you know what I'm going to do? I, I thought about this a couple days ago. I'm like, oh, I am going to get the, uh, I'm going to get the audio. What do you call it? The, um, audiobook version. No, well, it's not, I couldn't find it on, on the audio yet. It, it's coming out. It's coming okay. out. There will be an audio book. Well, what I was going to do is get the Kindle version and then I can get my Kindle reader to read it with, by using, um, pocket. So, uh, I was going to do that. And then I realized, ah, shit, I got to wait till after the interview. But I still may do that because <laughs> I am such a better passive listener to experience and, and, and you know, simultaneously think. Uh, it's it's going to be out on, be out on Audible soon? Uh, yeah. Sometime soon, yeah. We had the – I approved the, the reader for it a little while ago, so. Awesome. Yep. You, might, you might want to wait because they – Audible usually does a pretty good job of putting, you know, having – They do. Uh, or – most of the books I hear on there are awesome, and it's yeah, they are. I and I yeah. may wait. I wasn't sure if it was going to be on out on Audible, so there you go. It will be out on Audible soon, yep. but you guys should definitely pick it up. Uh, either way, um, and it is a really good read, and it's it's nice. uh, understandable, easily understandable. Um, doesn't dumb it down, and it also isn't overly complex. So thanks, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Right, awesome. All right, well, thanks, Matt, and we'll have to have you back on. My soon. pleasure. Yep. Awesome. Okay. And so here we go. Whoops. That's the wrong one. That's the wrong interface, Mike. There it is. Okay. <laughs> You've just enjoyed another awesome episode of The Mythwits. If you don't have time for videos, make sure to subscribe to our podcast via your favorite uh, podcatcher. Do the like, follow, subscribe thing wherever it's appropriate. And make sure to share your favorite episode on social media. Tell us spread The Mythwits love over the entire planet. It's a good one. This might be, this might be one of your favorites. Tweet us at MythWits and check out MythWits.com. MythWits is a TSR Podcast Network production. Check out TSR PN for more cool shows like this. Like, for example, Cube of Death, the show where industry guests compete in a trivia RPG adventure. MythWits is a Creative Commons product. Like and share it in all the places. Just don't edit it. Don't change it. And don't feed anyone a love, love potion while they are watching it or else you'll need to leave this dimension and wait for your parallel counterparts to die in order to take over their lives. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Tell your friends to tune in. And until next week.